Worship is why we are created. Worship is what we are to do. And a lot of times we don't quite understand everything that worship is. And especially in our culture, uh, it has some connotations that may not be exactly what God wants us to know. And so as I was in prayer and the Lord started speaking some of this to me about worship and how he is wanting to take us deeper, um, I was asking the Lord, okay, you said that the, the word for uh, this year for this church is jubilee, a spiritual season of freedom and restoration and redemption and power and your presence. And so it's absolutely natural that as we are moving from the jubilee series that the Lord is saying, now I want to show you what worship is all about. And I'm just going to give you a precursor for what we're going to be talking about in a few weeks, that God is saying, when we align with God, and when our worship is the type of worship that he prescribes and that pleases him, he responds with his glory. Now, the glory of God, it's his weight, it's his authority, it is his shining out. When the glory of God comes, there is holiness, there is wholeness, there is redemption, there is freedom, there's all of those things. And so even as our church is called kingdom culture and we're praying, God, let your kingdom coming, the king is saying, I want to come, but I have to prepare my people. And so as we are getting into worship I want to actually start today with a little bit of exercise. So I want everyone to take a moment, and also those of you that are watching online, take a moment and just kind of be aware of the atmosphere, kind of feel what's going on. Here in this house, we just finished with the music portion of our worship service, and so the presence of God is here. But Lord, as we take this next step into your word, I'm asking that you would come in a special and tangible way. Lord, I'm asking that you would forgive us of our sins, God, that you would wash us and cleanse us, anything that would hinder your presence from being free to do whatever it is that you want to do. We invite you into this place, into the place of our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our lives in Jesus' name. Now, the exercise that I want us to engage in is very simple. We're going to sing just a small part of a song, and don't worry if you don't know it, it only has one word, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those of you who have been part of our team for a while, you, you know where we're, what we're about to do. But again, I want you to be aware kind of of the feeling. Now, I'm not saying that worship is all about what you feel. In fact, there's a lot of what we're going to be talking about that worship is not centered on what we feel. But with what's about to happen, I want to kind of open your eyes to a spiritual reality that we're going to discuss today. All right, so bear with me. I'm not the best vocalist in the world, but it's not about the quality of the song, but the purity of the heart that sings it. Amen? Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Now I want you to feel this moment. Again, worshiping God is not about what you feel, but there is a tangible difference in the atmosphere when we worship. Let me explain this principle. It's found in Psalms chapter 22, verse 3. It says, God, you are holy, enthroned in the praises of your people. In this verse, it says Israel, but the principle is applicable to us. So whenever we begin to praise God, whenever we begin to lift him up, when we say, God, you are greater than my circumstance, that your life is, is greater than what it is that I'm going through, that on my worst day and on my best day, you are still good and you are holy and there is none like you. As we begin to praise the Lord, we are creating in the spiritual atmosphere a throne for the king to come and rest. How many of you would like the king of kings, the lover of your soul, to come and sit down and adjudicate on your behalf, in your family, in your workplace, in your world? 
It all starts with this thing that we call worship. And I posit that on the onset of this series, that when there is a, when there's a, 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 something that is out of alignment in our worship, everything else in our life will be out of alignment as well. But take heart, because the opposite is also true. When we get before God, when we do things according to his word, and our worship aligns with what he reveals is pleasing to him, the rest of our life comes into alignment as well. And so when we sing, it is absolutely a form of worship. But hear me, just because you're singing doesn't mean you're worshiping. When we're talking about worship, and it's the exaltation of God, and even that song that we just sang, the word hallelujah, means the highest praise. Why that word even exists is because human beings were saying, I do not have the vocabulary to ascribe to you the worthy, the, the worth and the value and, and just the height of who you are. There's nothing that I could say. I could give everything and it wouldn't even come close to being enough to match the magnitude and the glory of who you are. So the only thing that I can say from the depths of my soul is simply to raise a hallelujah to the King of kings and the Lord of lords that is worthy of all praise and adoration, that is glory, uh, that lives in unapproachable light and yet still condescends to love a fool such as I am. So when we sing hallelujah, what we're singing is God, I don't deserve it. And I don't deserve you, but you chose me anyway in the midst of my unworthiness because my worship is not about how worthy I feel. My worship is a, re is a result of the reality of know that I, even on my best day, I am not worth the glory in the kingdom of God. I don't worship because whether or not I feel worthy. I worship because he is worthy. See, true worship doesn't have to be generated. It's a natural and appropriate response to the revelation of who God is. And even as we were singing that song, and even now, I feel very heavy, a presence of God in this room, and I'm not trying to be spiritual or weird, but what I am saying is that when God comes into the room, when we praise him, it is not an emotional conjuring it is saying, God, you desire to have intimacy with me, and so I am going to desire to have intimacy with you. James 4, 8 says, if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. And that's what we're experiencing in this environment, and that's the heart of worship. God's saying, look, I, I, I made you all, not just so that I could kill you one day. How many of you had kids saying, man, I really hope I get to kill them one day? No, of course not. And God didn't do that either. And God gets a bad rap. Some people are looking at God as if he's this sadistic, judgmental maniac that creates these kids that could never measure up and then judges them for it. When that is so far from the truth, the reality is, is that God created us in a perfect environment with the freedom to choose. We chose ourselves instead of God. And the rest of human history and the biblical account is all about God coming with his plan of restoration and redemption to do what we could not do on our own. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means everybody has missed it. And that the wages of sin is death. Well, great, this isn't a very happy message. But the gospel is, is that we could never get to God. See, mo almost all human religion is all about man's attempt to get to God or to achieve nirvana or some level of spiritual enlightenment. But the reality of the gospel is that we can never get to God. So God himself stepped down in our world and came to us. And so that same God who condescended to the level of mortal man is the same God that desires you to draw near. See, he laid the groundwork in creation, and when we mess that up, he also laid the, the next groundwork of redemption. 
He gave us his Holy Spirit and, and his word. And now he's saying, I've given you absolutely everything you need to draw near. And then he sits and he waits. He says, I have initiated and I'm waiting for your response. And the moment we decide we want to draw near to God, he draws near to us. And that is the heart of worship. And so in the time of singing of this service, I wasn't just singing a song and when I sing, the presence of God comes. Because, I mean, I, I used to listen to a lot of, like, Led Zeppelin and, you know, just metal bands back in the day. And I'd sing all kinds of songs. No presence of God anywhere. I've also been in church services where I've been singing about God, but I've been thinking about other stuff, and I still am not feeling the presence of God. But when... The confession of my mouth to include the song that's coming out matches the heart and the mind of saying, God, I just want to lift you up. My words and my song could never be enough to ascribe you the, the holiness that you're due. But God, I just thank you that you're worthy and I'm not and you love me and that's amazing. So many times I get people asking me the question, why does God love me? Because he does. But why? I don't know. <laughs> because he does. And I pray I never get over that fact. And so here's the thing. Worship is a result of the revelation of God as he is the source of everything and everyone. And until you understand this principle, worship will always be a struggle. See, the Bible says in him we live and move and have our being that our lives are hid in Christ. And so I need to go into the secret place with Christ so that I can find my purpose and my life. And that's the essence of what worship is all about. It's not just about the song that you sing, but is the song of your life a sound that is pleasing to the Lord? Is the incense of our prayers, our actions, as David writes, the meditation of my heart, is it pleasing to God? And in the areas where I know I've missed it, where I know that I've been unpleasing to God, the enemy is right there as the accuser, whispering and telling me of where I've missed it, where I've blown it, and how I could never be good enough. But see, Jesus said, if you're faithful or if you confess your sins, then I'm faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. See, the enemy is still playing the same song he's played for millennia. He said, oh, sin, sin, sin. Then we sin. He said, oh, you sin. God's not going to love you. And see, Jesus dealt with the sin issue 2,000 years ago. I'm not saying your sin doesn't matter. What we do is extremely important. That's part of what we're going to look at in this series. But God is not so much after your behavior as he's after your heart. And when we get on the page with God where it's saying, God, yeah, I know, I'm messed up. I'm just, you know, but you're worthy. And you say you love me. I'm going to choose to believe it, regardless of what my circumstances or what my past or my parents or, or the enemy is whispering in my ear. Your word says it. I'm going to trust you enough to take you at your word. And let's, let's try to see what life is like. I'm going to trust that you love me. And what does that look like to walk into that? And, you know, ultimately of everything that I could say and what we're about to say in these next couple of, of messages, it all boils down to a heart that just simply says, thank you. There was a group of 10 lepers that Jesus healed and cleansed. It was a miracle. One of them, only one, came back to thank Jesus. And he said to them, well, where, where are the other nine? And he said, go your way, you've received your healing. Wait, what? I, I, I thought 10 received their healing. No, 10 received their cleansing of their body. There was a restoration in the physical, but the one who turned with, with a heart of gratitude and worship and came to give honor where honor is due, the one who fell at Jesus' feet and said, thank you, Lord, he said, now you have actually been healed in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, in your purpose. What, is, what good is it for us to gain the whole world and end up to lose our soul? We're crying out for a blessing or a paycheck or a job or a healing. But if we do not have a heart and a mind that is fixed on Christ, we can get all of that and still go to hell. 
Heaven is not a place. It is an environment centered around a person. His name is Jesus Christ. Worship is all about falling in love with the one who is head over heels in love with you. See, emotionalism, hype, and sensationalism, it's all a result of a lack of revelation. Because you may feel some things, but I don't need a cheerleader to get me to praise God. Why? Because I was lost and now I'm found. Why? Because I was dead and he made me alive again. I had no hope or a future and he gave me a purpose and a home. I know who my God is. There are some areas in my life where I have not walked with and experienced God and in those areas I can't but praise him except on an intellectual level. But there are some other areas where there are some valleys of the shadow of death that I've walked through where you can't tell me nothing about my Jesus because I know my Redeemer lives because he walked with me. He talks with me. He is the lifter of my head. He's given me a purpose and a future. And out of that, it's just an abundance of gratitude. So out of my mouth, with the behavior of my life, when I go to work, in everything that I do, I am doing my best to glorify God and I'm daily meeting with him, speaking with him and asking him for the wisdom and the grace to be more pleasing to him. Because, hear me, God is God. He owns everything. Ain't nothing you can give him. There's nothing that you can do that will add to God. He is bad all by himself, in himself, for himself. God was just as sufficient and and, and all-powerful before he created all y'all. So we do not take anything away from God, and we do not add anything to God. There's (laughs) nothing. God wants my money. He does not want your money. He wants your heart. Well, God's taking that. He ain't taking nothing. What he wants is your attention. He wants your time. And in fact, look, God says, when we're looking at tithe, right? So that's 10%. So God requires 10% of your money. And that's not about a financial obligation. It's do you trust me with the other 90? He wants 10% of your money, but then he also, but he requires in the Sabbath one seventh of your time. That's a higher percentage. I didn't do the math. I should have. I think it's somewhere around 13.4%. It's pretty close to that. So God wants your time more. He's like, look, I just want you. And why does God hate addiction? Why does God hate sin? Yes, it separates you from him. But the thing is, is that sin does not cause God to draw back from you. It causes you to draw back from God. When we sin, it puts a veil over our eyes so we can no longer see the father who loves us. Now, don't get me wrong. God is holy, the one who dwells in unapproachable light. I'm not just saying that God's sitting up there cool with your sin. He is not. Your sin will kill you. Dead. It did to Adam and it did to everybody since. But God has made a way for us to come back. And what he's saying is, I've already paid for the sin issue. The reason why God hates sin and addiction so much is because you begin to worship the experience, you begin to worship the feeling, you begin to worship whatever it is that your flesh or your heart is crying out for, and and it leaves God out of the equation. The Bible has a word for this. It's called idolatry. And so when I begin to worship, whether it be in a music service or, or just my own quiet time or even as I'm working, I'm working unto the Lord, I, I don't need someone to hype me up. Now, don't get me wrong. There are days when I'm tired and I'm just too through. And sometimes I go, okay, you know, let's get in the Word. Don't fall asleep. You know. so, but the reality is that when I get a glimpse of how good my God is, I just start a whole nother worship cycle. And there are times when I start paying too much attention to the wind and the waves around me. Work starts getting a little stressful. My friends uh, start acting crazy. Me and my wife start going through some struggles. And sometimes I can get my eyes off of Jesus. 
I get a little too tired and think I need a little too much recreation, start playing video games or watching too much TV, and slowly and surely, I start shifting my focus away from Jesus and onto the world, and this, this, seek, this, this quiet pride starts seeping in, and there's this philosophy that begins developing of, I don't really need God. And at first, it's just a little this, a little of that. And you walk uh, far enough, and then all of a sudden, you feel, why is my heart so cold? Why haven't I heard God's voice? Uh, You know, I I feel like I'm all alone and dark in the corner, and God, where are you? And you know what he's saying? I am right where I have always been. And that's why God calls us to live a life of repentance. It's the putting away and the breaking down and destroying of those things in our own soul, in our appetites, that we, anything that we want to fill ourselves with that is not God and is not good. Kids love candy. They do. I, you know, I, I must be part kid still because, you know, candy is amazing, right? It tastes good. It's fun. And if you let a three-year-old, they would completely subsist on cotton candy and Skittles. <laughs> but how many of you know, that may, you may be all right for a day, maybe two. You keep, you have a steady appetite that's going to kill you. Teeth going to fall out your head. You're going to act crazy, you know. It's not, it's not a good appetite, and you, that you cannot be sustained on that. And this is why God hates sin. He's saying you are filling yourselves with things that you cannot sustain life. Jesus said that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to come rot the spiritual teeth out your head, and so you lose your purpose, your function, and end up in a place where you're saying, how did I get here? But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. So I want you to be nourished by the the bread of my word. I want you to be washed by the water of my word, to be filled with the breath of my spirit so that you can live an abundant life with purpose. Why are we designed to worship? Is it because God is a glory hog? First of all, yes. And he is worthy of the glory. But secondly... It's because when we worship him, that is where we find the fullness of who God has created us to be. We were made to worship. And it doesn't matter whether or not you want to worship God. You do not have an option in whether or not you will worship. It's like Bob Dylan said, y'all going to worship somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you'll all worship somebody. You will worship, and if it's not God, it'll be sex or drugs, or alcohol, or entertainment, or pornography. All of us will bow down to an altar of something or someone. And what God is saying is when you worship me, not me, but God, when you worship God, you will find the fulfillment of your life. You know, and... When the music plays, you know, there's sometimes you get people sitting down with their arms crossed, just kind of looking at the screen, being like, oh, it was worship time. You know, and I get it. Not all of us can sing great. And don't get me wrong. If if you have, you know, there's some people that can't stand for long periods of time, whether there's an injury or, 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 you know, because of their age. And that's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about people who are fully capable in their bodies just sitting down while the music's playing going, is this over yet? You don't want to stand in honor and reverence during worship because you're tired. It's been a long day. But you don't realize that God is the one who created the bones in your legs, the muscles that surround them, the ligaments, that he provides the air in your lungs that gives nourishment to the blood, that gives energy to your body. How dare you not stand in his presence? And the point of this message is not to point a finger at you and say how bad of a person you are. What I'm saying is when we capture the essence and the power of what worship is, we start to see the greatness of who he is. It's not about you better stand during worship. It's not about the physical location of your body, but the physical location of your heart. I guess I should say the spiritual location of your heart because the, spirit, the physical location of your heart is about here. But when we get a revelation of the magnitude of God, the only response is you are holy, holy, holy. In fact, the Bible even records that there are cherubim around his throne, that since they were created from day one, eons past, 
They stand around the throne of God. They have six pairs of wings. With two, they cover their feet because God is holy and he is, it dwells in unapproachable light. They cover their face because of the magnitude of the holiness and the glory of God. And with two, they fly. And they cry out day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come. And every time a beam of God's glory cracks in through their wings, they get a fresh revelation of God and overwhelmed with his holiness and magnitude. And it's not that they are programmed on repeat. It's that they can't do anything else. They wouldn't want to do anything else. They are standing before the throne of the most high God and the only only appropriate response when we get a revelation of who God is, is you are holy. Holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. What does God desire from us? He desires that we be a people who understand who our Father is. And when we do, there will be a sacrifice involved. To praise God and to say thank you to him means that we're not just going on on our proud, selfish endeavors. That actually we have to stop, we have to say no to us and yes to Jesus. In fact, that's the heart of what worship is. Psalm chapter 141 verse 2 says, May my prayer be set before you like incense, May the lifting of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Everybody say that word, sacrifice. See, you can't worship God for who he is unless he has revealed himself to you, unless he walked with you through some things. Otherwise, that's not worship. That's regurgitation and repetition. And in fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, he said, when you pray, Do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Worship is not wrapped up in how long you sing or how many songs you sing. It's wrapped up in the expression of your heart. Who is God to you? To answer the question of the quality and consistency of your worship, Jesus is asking us the same question that he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Now, As a, let me just say it this way. In Luke chapter, I believe it was 11, there was a man named Lazarus. It was Jesus' friend. And uh, Lazarus ended up dying. And his friend said, hey, Jesus, Lazarus, he's, he's, he's getting sick. And they say he might die soon. We better get over there. And he said, no, it's actually good that this is about to happen. Hmm, okay. And then messengers come and say, no, no, he did. (laughs) And he said, this is good so that the glory of God may be revealed. What? Have you ever been in a situation where it feels like something has died in your life, a relationship, an opportunity, a hope, a dream? I'm not saying that all deaths are from God because he's trying to make a point. In fact, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But we serve a God that even in the midst of that, he says, I can still put my glory on display. So Jesus shows up. He talks to the sisters, and they say, yeah, uh, Jesus, he, he did. And he said, well, it's been four days. Go ahead and remove the stone. Martha's like, uh, you're going to smell bad. That's, mm-mm. Because after four days, the body starts rotting and decomposing. and says, we, we, we can't do that. And he said, did I not tell you that you would see the glory of God? Now, you guys know what happens next. Jesus utters the famous words, Lazarus, come forth. And the man who was in the tomb wrapped in grave clothes, which was actually a prophetic precursor for Jesus' own resurrection, Comes out, and he's like, yo, can y'all tie me? (laughs) And now, Jesus comes to us, and he's saying, untie that man, 
let him go free. And, you know, a couple of weeks later, they were having a big meal and sitting down with this guy. And I can just imagine what that potluck was like. (laughs) That guy was dead. (laughs) Yeah, I know, because I had the same thing happen in my life. See, when I was a teenager, I went through some craziness. I ran away from the Lord, started chasing the world, and after many years, I felt like I was dead. I was without purpose and hope. I was chasing happiness, but every day my joy got less and less. I didn't find any fulfillment. I thought I came to the very end. I was like, there is no point. It is hopeless. It is worthless. What is it all for? And it's in that place that Jesus met me. And he says, son, I know you got some hurt. Roll away the stone. I'm like, yeah, but that, that's that painful place. And he said, son, let me in. And I said, okay. And instantly, he made me alive. He brought me peace. He gave me hope. And in that place, the only thing that I could do was just say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what is Worship. Anytime I do any type of a study, there's something that we call the law of first mention. So the first time we see something show up in the biblical narrative is where it gets its foundational meaning. And actually, every other time that it appears, you refer back to that first thing. Again, it's called the law of first mention. And the very first time we see the word worship pop up in Scripture is in Genesis chapter 22, verse 5. It's in a very familiar scenario where we see Abraham trusting God. God says, all right, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, and uh, the inheritance is going to come through him, and everyone's going to be blessed through this guy, through this son, Isaac. And Abraham raises this son, loves him, grows up. He's about 16 years old. And then God shows up and says, Abraham, my man. You're my friend, right? Yeah, God, we're friends. Cool. Uh, That son I gave you, go kill him. Now, I love Abraham because I couldn't imagine the wrestling that he did that night, but it said immediately, the very next morning, his first opportunity, he got the boy, he got everything else, he loaded the donkey, did everything, he said, all right, we're going to go. And uh, they finally got to the mountain, he says, all right, we're going to go up there, talk to uh, all of his attendants, and he said, all right. In verse 5, he said, stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there. And we will worship, then we will come back to you. Was it saying that they were going to have a praise service led by Brandon Lake? No. There was no singing involved. But he does say, we will worship. And so what this says to me is that the heart of worship involves humility, faith, obedience, and sacrifice. I'm going to say that again. Worship involves humility, faith, obedience, and sacrifice. And I love how Hebrews gives us some insight into Abraham's thought process. And in chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, it says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned, that God could even raise the dead. So in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. And I love that because Abraham was like, cool, I get to see a resurrection. Sorry, Isaac, this is probably going to hurt, but I'll see you again. Don't worry about it. You know, and I love that because they're going up and Isaac's like, all right, we're getting close to the spot. There's the altar, cool, donkey, cool, cool. There's the wood, there's the fire. Wait, where's the sacrifice? He said, lay down. (laughs) What? That was a very interesting father-son bonding retreat, you know. Um, And as he's about to lift up the knife, I can't imagine, even though he knew God was going to come through, he didn't read the rest of Genesis. Abraham didn't know how God was going to do it. He said, well, am I going to actually have to kill this guy? And then that's going to be an awkward conversation when God resurrects him. (laughs) You killed me. I know. I'm sorry, you know. Sorry, not sorry. He told me to, you know. Um, So he gets the knife. It's right about here. God stops him and he says, now I know that you are really trusting me and that you have faith. And now we think that how we interpret that is what God was looking for information. No, 
When God said, now I know, what he was really saying is now I am revealing myself to you and now you know that you put it all on the line for me. Now you know that you're a man of faith. And it was a prophetic picture of God and what he did to Jesus. See, there was nobody to stop the knife. God, the Father, sacrificed his son. There was no one stopped the knife. But because his, Jesus' death and resurrection, now we have hope and a future. And that's why Jesus is called the author and finisher of our faith. And so you have Abraham, who then, he's like, okay, didn't kill Isaac. That was a crazy test, but it appears I passed. Everybody's good. And then now Isaac's like, okay, but there's the altar. We still got this whole thing. Where where are we going to sacrifice? And Abraham says, the Lord will provide. And they look over and they see a ram, which if later on when the law uh, is established, the ram was actually a peace offering. They see a ram caught in a thicket, and and Abraham looks, and he says, this was a crazy journey, but now God has revealed himself as my provider. And so he calls upon the name of the Lord, and for the very first time in human history, he is known as Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. See, God walked with Abraham through some things and revealed himself in that place as a provider, And that is the heart of worship, is that when we are walking through our life, God will take us through some things, and it gives in the hardship, we'll actually give him an opportunity to reveal himself to us. See, Peter didn't know that he could walk on water until Jesus said it was so. So, It was, let me see. So worship is only for the Lord because he is the only one that can do what he can do. You know, we look at the lives of of Moses. God led them through the Red Sea and immediately when they get to the other side, the waves crash down, kill all the Egyptians. Immediately Moses just erupts into song. Why? Because he saw a revelation of his God that day that he had never seen before. So he could only respond in praise and in worship. David, he said, though I walk through a valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to be afraid because you're with me. And this was the psalm that he wrote right after facing Goliath. He literally, you know, it says the valley of the shadow of death. It is a valley where he met with Goliath, but it's a really wide valley. Could it be when he said, The shadow of death. He's not talking about the shadow from the peaks in the valley. He's talking about standing in the shadow of that nine-foot guy who was about to shove a javelin through his skull. When he said, I I faced a giant down, and I I now know that my God is a giant slayer. Mary... When the angel came and prophesied over her and then she uh, became pregnant by the Holy Spirit and and met with her cousin Elizabeth and John the Baptist leapt in in Elizabeth's womb and, and then all of a sudden she was hit with the Holy Spirit, she began prophesying. She began singing and praising. Worship just began to to flow out of her. And that is the cry of my heart is, Lord, help me to be a vessel. I want to be able to hear what it is you're saying. I want to live with open hands so that when you decide you want to give me something, I can carry the will and the word of God in my life. And as I receive you in my life, it can only result in the expression of gratitude with my mouth, with my life. Has he healed you? It's because he's a healer. Has he restored you? It's because he's a redeemer and the repairer of the breach. Has he provided for you? It's because he's a provider. Has he delivered you? It's because he is a deliverer. Has he given you a hope and a future? It's because he is your sovereign father. Has he loved you in the secret place? It's because he is the lover of your soul. Do you have breath in your lungs? Even if you didn't hit anything else on that list, you got that one. 
It's because he is the source of life, and in him we live and move and have our being. If God has done something for you in this place, just take a second and give God a praise. Lord, we thank you that you are good, that you are holy, that you are the one who does what no one else can do. You open the doors that no one can shut. You shut the doors that no one can open. We thank you that you are the one who goes before us. You are the one who stays behind, that your glory is our rear guard as we keep our eyes and affection on you. We praise you in this place, Lord. I love the Greek and the Hebrew languages because they're so pictorial that one word has so many multifaceted meanings. Whereas English, it's pretty much just kind of flat. It's kind of two-dimensional. But the Greek and the Hebrew, there's, there's so much uh, more fullness to it. And so this word of worship in the Hebrew is shacha. It literally means to bow down or to pay homage to. In the Greek, it's the word proskuneo. It's where we get the word prostrate from, which means to humble oneself. Me, me and my uh, pastor, Dina, were going over my word, and we both kept saying that last word wrong. And it was like, nope, that's not, that's not where that word comes from. <laughs> but that Greek word of worship means to kiss the hand. In our modern vernac- vernacular, we would say to kiss the ring. A beautiful picture of what this means is found in Psalms chapter 2. I'm going to read a couple verses in the beginning and a couple in the end. It says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. And it goes on about talking about the rebellion of the world and the world system against God. But then in verse 10, it says, Now therefore be wise, O kings. Now I'm going to stop there. God, He is our God, He is our judge, He is our king, but He is also our Father. That makes you and I sons and daughters, and therefore inheritors of His kingdom. That means that we are also royalty. God, the word says that we are a royal priesthood. We are princes and and princesses that are to grow up in maturity and become kings and queens. Those that continue the family business in power and authority like our father. And so when he says, be wise, O kings, he's talking to us, children of the king. He says, be instructed, you judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Notice this next line, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. And so we see worship has this picture of humility, of bowing down, of he is the one who has the, and that, that uh, word picture of the ring, of kissing the ring, the ring was the signet ring. It was the stamp of approval. It was a symbol of authority. And so what it's saying is, God, I thank you that you've called me to be a king, but my authority only comes because I am submitted first to your authority. And I love the word worship, even in English, where it derives from is an old uh, combination of words, which means worth-ship. The heart of worship is ascribing to God what he is worth. See, I need God even to need God. I need the love of God so that I can love God. The Bible even says he loved us, sorry, we love him because he first loved us. And so to worship God, I am completely incapable of offering a worship that is pleasing to God. So I even need him to need him. I need him to worship him. And so that's why I say, come Holy Spirit, empower me to sing. And it's not about the vocal intonation, but I'm saying, God, I need your strength. I need your power. I need your perspective. I need your life living on the inside of me so that I can live a life that is pleasing to you. The word says that our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. But then Jesus comes and he says, I encourage you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that I may clothe you with my robes of righteousness. 
The parable of the wedding feast, he says that there was someone standing at the door. It says you, everybody had this uniform they put on, and it's a picture of the kingdom. We can only go to the wedding feast of our king as we put on the righteousness of God. This is not something that I come in with. This is something that he clothes me with. And there was someone who wanted to be around the party but decided they didn't want to put on the clothes of righteousness. And he said, friend, how the heck did you get in here? Grab that man, throw him out. And so worship is all about, I worship him, but then I even need him to be able to worship him. I am clothed with him, filled with him. He is on my lips. He's on my thoughts. He's in my heart. And it's all about living my life to where there's this pull of the world. There's this pull of my flesh and my appetites that keep trying to entice me away from my God. And what worship is, is saying no to the flesh so that I can say yes to my king. Spiritual warfare is less about fighting demons and more about fighting your flesh and your propensity to walk away. He is worthy. In fact, he alone is worthy. He is creator. He created everything, and therefore, he owns everything. In fact, that's where this word we see over and over in the the Bible comes from, the word Lord, or where that word comes from, the word Jehovah. It literally means owner and master. So we have a prayer time in our house, and, and at that time, people come in because we say, hey, this is a scheduled time, where, and we say, you don't have to knock. Some people still do, and thank you, I appreciate that, but we have kind of an open door policy at that time. But outside of that time, if you just walk into my house, even my own brother-in-law, who I love dearly, just walk, he stopped doing that, by the way, just walk in my house, I, I meet him right at the door and says, what do you think you are doing Why are you just walking into my house? Well, why? Because as much as I love him, this is my house. (laughs) I I just want to know who's coming in. And it's my job as the head of the house, the protector of the house, to make sure, because we've, you know, we keep the doors locked because we've had people that we don't know try to come into our house. And it's like, um, no, you don't come here. We had a pool guy that we did, he showed up on a wrong day. We didn't know it was him. Let's just say it did not, it was, there was a little bit of a confrontation, police almost were called. It was kind of a tense situation. We, we calmed it all out. Everything was fine. But why was that tension there? Why was there conflict? It was because someone was in my property that was not authorized to be there. And see, what I love is that God is king of the universe. We are his sons and daughters that he gives us permission We can now boldly come to the throne of grace and cry out, Abba, Father. And so why do we worship? See, worship is not just about bowing down out of duty or obligation. He's God, so I better get low. Now, don't get me wrong. Amen. He is God. You better get low. But it's also, yes, we we worship God in reverence, in holy fear, as well as, as, as love and appreciation and gratitude. See, I get on my face in terror of God while loving him all the way through it. See, there's a huge difference between being afraid of God and drawing near to him in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not being afraid of God or his wrath or or his judgment. It is being afraid of being out of his presence, of breaking intimacy, of exposing myself to the demonic and things that are outside of his life. And so why do we worship? Because he alone is worthy He is worthy to open up the scrolls of the end time judgments. He is worthy of being the judge of all flesh. He is worthy of having the name which is above every name. He is worthy of bestowing crowns and having those crowns thrown back at his feet. He is worthy of laying his life down and taking it back up again. He is worthy of coming back to the Mount of Olives that when his foot touches the ground, the earth will crack and the king's gate will finally be opened. He is worthy to walk through It is worthy of having the name of King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is worthy of being the commander of heaven's armies. He is worthy of all of our affection, all of our attention and adoration and allegiance. He is worthy. And I'm going to finish with this. 
In John chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. To worship him in spirit, let's first of all talk about what the spirit is. It is a very real reality that we cannot tangibly see with our eyes, smell with our nose, hear with our ears. There are times when the spirit breaks into the natural, and that's why we call that supernatural. But when we're talking about the realm of the spirit, they are the unseen attributes of God. We have them as well. The emotions, the thoughts, the... the, uh, Areas of our, that, that control uh, the atmospheres that we are living in. So to worship God means, uh, to worship God in spirit means to worship God with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. It's not just about what we do on the outside. It's about who we are. What's going on in our heart? What's what's going on in the area of our passions? So we are to worship God in spirit, but we are also to worship God in the truth, which means we worship God according to his word, how he prescribes. There's a lot of people that are very spiritual, and they have all kinds of things that they call worship, but there's only one kind of worship that pleases God, and it's found in his word. And that's what we're going to spend the next few weeks looking at, is God, teach us how to worship you. Teach us how to have that mentality and, and, and affection for you. Help me to grow in love and holy fear. Help me to, to be more of who you've created me to be. God, help there to be a greater picture of my life. God, I'm asking that as I'm in my perspective, that you would increase and that I would decrease. And so as we go out of this place today, the Lord is asking, who is it that you say that I am? 